Good morning. Uh, Christ is risen. I know some of you are probably sitting here wondering, where is Pastor Dale? Uh, I'm Reverend Christina Blake. I am the district superintendent for the Lower Shore. Pastor Dale is ill and uh, could not be here this morning. And so uh, I'm your last minute replacement. Uh, we all know that if Pastor Dale was able to be here, Pastor Dale would be here. And he is just really not, not feeling well and so um, asked me if I would graciously step in. So I, I am uh, apologize that, that I'm not who you're looking for this morning, but uh, we're going to do our best to, to get through this service together. And I'm just wondering, like, uh, I never understand when I come into churches that no one ever sits with this lady. She's the smartest one here, by the way, that sits in the front row. Because the front row, you have more leg room. You can put your legs out. It's a much more comfortable place to sit than anywhere else in the church. Am I right? So, uh, you know, grab those front row seats. Uh, we don't fight up here. We're not going to spit on you or anything like that uh, or call on you to help uh, just because you're sitting in the front row. But I uh, uh, welcome you to Community Church, and we're going to uh, celebrate the, the risen Savior today, today together.
Good morning, fellow Christians. Before the bell, before the Jubilati ringers, the bell choir leaves, I think we need to really thank them. They work each week for an hour to prepare for maybe one show a month. And God bless them. Uh, thank you, Sally, for helping them. And let's give them a big applause. And by the way, if you have a heart for music and can ding-a-ling a bell, they'd be glad to have you join them. Easter Sunday is here. Hallelujah, he is risen. Let us together celebrate that Jesus Christ has defeated death and lives again. The tomb is empty. Thanks be to God. Let us celebrate for eternity. Welcome to Community Church at Ocean Pines. My name is Jack Snyder. Thank you for coming to celebrate Easter with us. May God bless you. Now let us pray together. O oh Lord, your wondrous birth means nothing unless we are born again. Your death and sacrifice means nothing unless we die to sin. Your resurrection means nothing if you be risen alone. Raise and exalt us, O Savior, both now and to the estate of grace and hereafter to the state of glory, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, God forever and ever. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship if you can stand and are able to do so and participate in a responsive manner. Christ the Lord is risen today. Now that you're standing, let's sing him 302. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Amen. Please join me as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to turn now to a time of prayer and share with each other our joys and our concerns. And we definitely want to keep Pastor Dale in our prayers. Yes, ma'am. You said Mark Bender family? Yes. Lynn Goddard. Yes, ma'am. Garrett. Yes, ma'am. In the back. I think there was um, this lady right here. Linda. Lynn. Lynn. And who did you said Laura? You said Hancock, Adcock. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can you say the last name again? Mendenhall. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of this day. It is a glorious day to be worshiping you in this house. What a blessing and privilege it is to be here in person as we celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, and his victory over sin and death. Lord, we are shouting from the rooftops our hallelujahs and our, our skin is, we're just coming out of our skin with joy and, and worship for you this morning. But Lord, along with that joy, we also know that, that we carry burdens and you say that we can lay our burdens at your feet. And so this morning we, we lay these at your feet and we pray for, as we pray for Thomas Glanville and Chris Mendenhall and Jim and Karen Adcock, Jean Lewis, 
Garrett Canteen. We pray for Lynn as she uh, battles cancer, and we pray for Ennest for healing for him. We pray for Janice, and we pray for Pastor Dale, and we pray that, that he is resting and allowing his body to, to get the rest it needs in order to heal. We pray for Jessica Kulik. We pray for Laura Lassiter. And we pray for Mark Bender as he grieves the, the loss of his wife. We pray for Lynn Goddard. We pray for the folks in Bridgeville and Green, Greenwood, Delaware, as they recover from a tornado last week and as they put the pieces of their life back together. Help us to be the hands and feet that help them to do that. We pray for the folks in Christiana, Delaware, who endured a mass shooting yesterday and at the mall, a mall that many of us are familiar with. And Lord, we pray for our nation as it, as it navigates through many, many difficult times and difficult people. Lord, we pray for peace in this nation and we pray that we can be the nation that you have called us to be. We pray for our vets and for those serving in our military, particularly those who are deployed overseas and are spending this Easter away from their families so that we can be in this house today worshiping you without fear and, and allowing us to have the freedoms and privileges that we enjoy each and every day and often give no thought to. There is a young man or a young woman somewhere giving their service to this country to allow us this privilege and for that we are ever grateful but lord we come to you mostly today grateful for the gift of your son jesus christ there is no greater gift that we will ever receive in this life or the next than jesus christ and so we are so thankful that he came to this earth for us that he died for us he rose for us he defeated sin and death for us so that we could have a place in your kingdom eternally. There is no greater gift, and for that we give thanks and praise. And we pray all of these things with the words that he taught us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Uh, time for another thank you uh, to the choir. Uh, they work hard each week, uh, sometimes two hours. We've got quite a leader there in Sally, and she works as good. But I heard something the other night that we might be one of the larger church choirs on Eastern Shore right now. Today we have 21, 22 people. We haven't had this since before COVID. So thank you very much, Sally and Dick, our organist. Please now hear the scripture passage for today. It's Luke 24, verses 28 to 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, hey, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is a word of God for the people of God. Before we go on, I'd like to throw one more thank you out. Thank you, Superintendent Tina Blake, for being with us today and helping us to celebrate Easter in the absence of our pastor. Thank you. Now, if you're able, please stand and sing hymn 322, Low in the Grave He Lay.
You know, they teach you in preaching class and seminary, uh, the preaching professor will always say, you know, pastors, always keep a sermon in your pocket because you're never going to know when you're going to be called on. But then they also tell you that you should preach your best sermons on Easter and Christmas. So I, I don't know if I was able to pull that one out of my pocket or not for you, but uh, uh, the good news is that the scriptures on Easter remain pretty much pretty familiar, so uh, able to roll with them. I'm going to age myself uh, a little bit here, and for some of you I'm going to be uh, too old, and for some of you I'm going to be too young, and for others I'm going to be like Goldilocks, I'm going to be just right. So there is a song um, that I uh, used to listen to it's that went, you broke the bonds and you loosened chains, carried the cross of my shame. You know, I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now, this is a song that was by the group U2. It wasn't a Christian song, so in case all of you are wondering where in the world did that song come from, it was on the radio. And it is a song about restlessness and disappointment. It's a song about longing and doubt. And right now, folks, we are living in a world full of people experiencing restlessness and disappointment. People who have great longing an incredible doubt. People who are searching, searching for something, anything, but there's something that they know is missing from their lives. And so some of those folks, they go looking for it in titles and prestige and honor. Some work really hard to find some peace in their lives. Some look for love and acceptance by other people. Folks are looking for all kinds of things in all kinds of places. And they think that they're going to find it in their jobs. Some think they're going to find it in the bottom of a bottle or the end of a needle. They think that if they just get that bigger house with more square footage or the car of their dreams, or maybe if they can draw the attention and love of the person that their heart aches for, that they're going to find it. And people have tried all of these things and many, many more things. But guess what? They still haven't found what they're looking for. Jesus. Jesus broke the bonds. Jesus loosened the chains. Jesus carried the cross of all of our shame. And we believe it. We are here today because we believe it. At least we believe it in our heads. And, and most of the time, we not only believe it in our heads, we believe it in our hearts. But then sometimes, life throws us a curveball. And our hearts begin to tell another story and our, our lives begin to tell another story. And so many of us, even today, many of us in this room sitting here still haven't found what we're looking for. But yet each and every Sunday, Christian people come together on Easter Sunday each and every year. And, and we come together and we celebrate. We're excited about the victory of Jesus. And guess what? The story is always the same. No matter what's going on in our lives or in our world, whether Easter falls early in spring or Easter falls as spring is making its way out, the tomb is always empty. Though each of our gospel stories may differ in minor details, the tomb is always empty. And that is where we can stake our faith. We can't stake our faith on a lot of things, 
but we can stake our faith on that. We can place our faith that early in the morning, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and a disciple whom Jesus loved went to the tomb where Jesus had been laid. Now, they were not joyous and celebrating like we are here today. They were confused. What had just happened? How could Jesus have died on a cross? He was supposed to be their Messiah after all. He was supposed to be the one that was going to free them from the Romans and free them from oppression. How could he have died? They were grief stricken and shell shocked. He was their friend. They loved him. They'd given up their lives for him. And then he died. And he died in a horrific way for which they witnessed in a way that they were unable to fully process. And so they arrived at the tomb early on the morning of the third day, only to find it empty. Jesus wasn't there at all. But yet they had gone there to find Jesus in the tomb. So it still seems they hadn't found what they were looking for. They certainly weren't looking for a resurrected Jesus. I don't think we would have expected a resurrected Jesus if we had been there early on that first Easter morning. You see, we know the rest of the story. They didn't. And so without the rest of the story, would we have believed? Would we have found there what we were looking for? Think about it. Would we have expected to find a resurrected Jesus? What would it have taken to convince us that someone we loved had come back to life after having been dead, seriously dead, as my daughter would say, for three days? Suppose it had been someone we loved. And suppose we had watched them die in a horrific way. What would it have taken to convince us? I mean, it's not like rising from the dead happens every other day, or at all, for that matter. So what would it have taken to convince us? No one has risen from the grave and had, did not, who did not have to die again since Jesus or before Jesus. Even the people who knew and loved Jesus best had a hard time swallowing the story that Mary and Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved were telling them. An empty tomb, angels, a resurrected Jesus. They weren't expecting a resurrection. They weren't even thinking resurrection. Now Jesus had told them that he was going to rise again after three days, but they didn't remember anything Jesus said. I don't know that they fully listened to Jesus when he was alive. They, they couldn't figure most things out. So they had forgotten most of what he said. And because they had forgotten, they had given up hope of ever seeing Jesus again. The very people who should have known, who should have expected, and who should have believed, didn't. When you read this story, the only people who believed were the chief priest and the Romans. Matthew 27, 66, 62 through 66 tells us the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. Now the chief priest and the Romans were thinking resurrection, but the believers were not thinking resurrection. When Mary came to the tomb that Sunday morning, she was not looking for a resurrection. She came there to anoint the body of Jesus. 
You see, in those days, a body was prepared for burial by covering it with spices and then pouring on a sticky kind of ointment. But in the confusion and the lateness of Jesus' death on Friday afternoon and the, the rush to get him in a tomb before the Sabbath started, the spices had been placed on Jesus, but not the ointment. And so Mary got up as soon as the Sabbath had ended so that she could go and finish the job. That's what she came to do. That's what she was looking to do that Sunday morning. But what did she find when she got there? A rolled away stone and an empty tomb. And all four Gospels agree on this fact. But still, she didn't have the slightest clue as to what happened because she was not looking for a resurrection. She was looking for the body of Jesus. And so what she found made no sense to her. Even when the angel said, he's not here, but don't be alarmed. Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified, he has risen. He is not here. Even after the angels told her what had happened, she still did not believe it. And so I have this mental picture of the three of them, Mary, Peter, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, standing there, dumbfounded, frozen, not knowing what to think or do. And I imagine that at least one of them was thinking to themselves, no one rises from the dead, not after three days, not after being beaten and scourged, not after being crucified, not after hanging on a cross for six hours, surely not having a, after a sword has been thrust in their side, and definitely not after having 75 pounds of spices and wrapped in a suffocating burial cloth upon them, and not after that tomb was sealed. It's impossible. Sure, he said he would rise again. He said he was son of God, but we saw him die. We buried his dead body. No one rises from the dead. No one. So this is the end of the story. It would be nice if it were true. But we have to move on. They did not believe it. The people who knew Jesus best and loved him the most did not believe that Jesus had risen from the gate, grave. Not from the angel. They could not and would not believe it. The people who knew Jesus best and loved him most did not expect a resurrection. They had to be convinced. So they still hadn't found what they were looking for. Now I'm guessing right about now you know I'm not preaching from the gospel lesson that Reverend Dale picked out. Um, being that it came late and I had to pull this out of my pocket, I'm preaching from the gospel of John. But I'm going to work in what he picked because what happened? The disciples were not convinced. They weren't convinced by the story of Mary, Peter, and the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciples walking on the road to Emmaus with Jesus did not recognize him until that bread had been broken. Thomas refused to believe the people he'd been hanging out with closely for three years, or most of whom he had known all of his life, he would not believe until he was able to put his hands in Jesus' hands and in his side and in his feet. What finally convinced these disciples was not a what. It was a who. It wasn't Mary Magdalene, Peter, or the disciple whom Jesus loved. Although they were eyewitnesses and their stories were consistent, it wasn't them who convinced the disciples. What convinced the disciples finally was Jesus himself. Jesus convinced them. Jesus convinced them that the tomb was empty, that he had risen just as the angel had said, and that he was alive in the flesh. What convinced them that was that Jesus was walking with them and talking with them and eating with them. The same Jesus, the one that they had watched die, was now alive. And they saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They heard his voice. They looked into his face. And they knew it was true that he had come back from the dead. He was alive against all their expectations. 
all that they thought they knew, he was alive. Jesus had risen from the dead and they had finally found what they were looking for. And they didn't find it in a career opportunity or a fancy home or a sporty car. They didn't find it in a temporary fix or infatuation or mood altering substance. What they found came in a person, a Messiah, someone who would and could and did fill them completely with love and grace. Someone who would offer them life and not a conditional life, a life that is here today but gone tomorrow, but a permanent life and a permanent existence in a, in a perfect kingdom, a kingdom that moths could not destroy and thieves could not steal. Jesus, Jesus broke the bonds. Jesus loosened the chains. Jesus carried the cross of all our shame. He is who we are looking for. He said, I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. Anyone who believes in me, even though they die like anyone else, shall live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. Friends, where else can we get a promise like that in this world? Where else will we ever get a promise like that in this world? Nowhere. And who else can give us that kind of promise? No one. Jesus is the one we are looking for. Jesus is the one we are looking for. He is the one we were looking for yesterday. He is the one we are looking for today. And he is the one we will be looking for tomorrow. Jesus is the one and only one. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Going to ask now if our ushers would come forward as we give the first fruits of our labor to the Lord.
Amen. Don't fire me that we didn't say this prayer for the offertory. Um, so let's say it together now so I, don't, I can keep my job. <laughs> Dale might not ever, good news is Dale might not ever get sick and ask me again. <laughs> but the bad news is Dale might get sick and never ask me again. So let's pray this together. Dear Lord, may I realize afresh today what your death and resurrection mean for me. Forgiveness, freedom, and the ability to walk with you through this fallen world into eternity. May I always find my satisfaction in you and your willingness to offer yourself to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we sing the closing hymn number 364, Because He Lives. together our closing prayer. O oh God, our light, our beauty, our rest. In the resurrection of your Son, you have brought us into your new creation. Form us into your people and order our lives in you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Go now in peace. Never be afraid. 
God will go with you each and every hour of each and every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Know he will guide you in all you do. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, praise be to God. Amen. Amen.